So we're talking about 1950s South Africa, all right? And we're talking about a South Africa with a tiny white minority, uh, a several million, and then a much larger, three to five times larger black African majority, also consisting of a lot of people from India who the British brought in uh, from their other <clears throat> colony. Uh, and a series of important laws that I would want you to be able to recognize, the passbook law that you had to carry, you can see the man with his passbook, you were not allowed to travel if you didn't have this uh, and it had all your information in it. It was illegal to get married if you were uh, mixed race, white, black, or um, white colored. This was against the law. Um, and the Population Registration Act, which really laid out and defined the categories of Bantu, white, colored, and Asian. This was 1950 and everybody was gonna be given a specific identity. But this is more complicated than it even sounds because um, um, you know, people are gonna have different heritages and different backgrounds uh, and things like that. I had mentioned uh, Trevor Noah earlier, the uh, famous comedian who's quite popular in the United States these days. Um, this is his autobiography, a book he wrote about his life, uh, and he titled it Born a Crime because his parents were an example of people who broke that law because they loved each other and one was black and one was white. Um, and there are many, many examples of people breaking laws like the passbook laws, um, the population registration laws, but the government did everything it could to enforce these laws. Um, this is just to show you uh, what the population was that we're looking at and how much it's changed over time. So we start with 1911 and we go to 2004. Um, you can see that the white percentage has decreased uh, significantly from being about a fifth of the country to now being only about a tenth of the country. Um, the total population has also grown quite dramatically. I put that on the top of the screen there, 17 and a half million in the 1960s, up to 56 million by 20. 17. And to be even more detailed, I found this one chart to break it down. This is uh, in 1904 that we're talking about, right? A million whites and three and a half million blacks, uh, which really puts a different um, context onto this uh, attempt by the white population to maintain its control when they are so clearly a minority. Uh, let's dive into um, the African National Congress. The African National Congress, which is still in power today in uh, South Africa, was created in 1912. It didn't get much done in its first 30 or 40 years. In fact, blacks lost rights. They lost the right to vote in Cape Town. They lost a lot of uh, freedoms and privileges, and things just seemed to keep getting worse uh, and worse. Um, but the fact that it was there was important because they're going to evolve and change over time. One of the big changes will be inspired by this young fellow who you might not recognize in the picture. Does anybody know who this is? Uh, Nathan? Gandhi. This is Gandhi, that's right. He's much more recognizable in this picture, but that's a young Gandhi uh, in the you know, 1900s, late 1800s. This is the time he spent in South Africa. Um, and one of the most important things he did is he brought this idea of using nonviolence nonviolence to try to fight to change the system. So he was fighting for equal rights in South Africa at a time when there weren't even that many people who were doing that yet, right? And it says in your notes, 1946, the Atlantic Charter that we talked about uh, was passed uh, by England and America that said all people should be free to choose their form of government. Well, South Africa was inspired by this. They were like, yes, that means us. Unfortunately, the rest of the world was like, no, we didn't really mean you yet, right? Nevertheless, this inspires the ANC, and it inspires this young man, Nelson Mandela, who takes over the leadership in 1949, and he says it's time for a change. It's time for us as the ANC to get much more active. Here's a young Nelson Mandela who was a, trained as a lawyer. He launches, along with the ANC, the Defiance Campaign. The idea was we're going to break the laws that are not fair. We're gonna break the laws that are racist and we're gonna fill the jails. And so 8,000 people got arrested, but even more importantly, over 100,000 people joined the ANC and joined the movement. And this was huge, right? This defiance campaign made a lot of progress. It got a lot of attention around the world. Before this, people didn't even know about apartheid in South Africa. 
open the jails we want to enter good people disobey bad laws this were these were the slogans right it takes a lot of training and practice uh, and preparation to convince good people to to get break laws and go to jail right and the most common volunteers are the young uh, but there were plenty of people across all generations and it was a really big deal you can see some of the numbers here 8000 blacks and indians working together getting arrested uh, the, the, the ranks of the ANC growing dramatically. How did the government respond? The South African government had its Suppression of Communism Act. They had a law that said, if we can accuse you of being a communist, then we can just arrest you. And basically they used this against anybody who wanted freedom. The ANC's response, importantly, was its 1955 Freedom Charter that said, not only do we believe in nonviolence, but we believe, believe bleh, sorry, we believe that South Africa belongs to all peoples who live here, black and white, and everybody in between. We want to create, they called it a rainbow nation. We want a South Africa for everybody. This was what they were fighting for. This is what they were talking about. Now, uh, the South African government's response, right? Oops, was that last one? I couldn't see it because it was behind your faces, but it's on there. Uh, was the massive arrest of ANC leaders. Uh, they were held in prison for many, many years, and they were brought on what was called the treason trials. And if they were found guilty, they would be executed. These trials dragged out for four years. And amazingly, the South African government, with all of its power and its willingness to kind of abuse people, didn't have any actual evidence of crimes. And so these people were found innocent, and they were all released. This was a huge victory for the movement. In the middle of all that, we had the famous Alexandra bus boycott. Does anybody know who that woman is? Yeah, Oliver. Uh, Rosa Parks. That's Rosa Parks. And she was not in the Alexander bus boycott, but of course it was inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott that had made a huge change in uh, helping to start the American civil rights movement. Um, and so this was a protest of the bus system in South Africa, in particular in Alexandra, uh, and people refused to take the bus. To many, it was seen as a great victory, there were others, though, who criticized it and said it didn't end apartheid, so what are you celebrating, right? But they did get them to change the prices and the rules and regulations on the buses. They saw this as the, a beginning point for a nonviolent struggle. The South African government was very clever. They created a system called the Homeland Strategy. These homelands, you can see the colors here on the map, right? Uh, purple, blue, green. Uh, Africans basically were divided up and then they were assigned to the homeland of their origin. Didn't matter where you lived or where you worked, but this was gonna be your home if you were black. And they created 10 essentially fake countries. And what this meant was that South Africa itself was all white people. This was a, a sort of a genius move of the South Africans, right? Those are 10 separate countries, free and independent countries with their own presidents chosen by us, South Africa, right? But now when we hold elections in South Africa, we're not keeping anybody from voting. Every South African votes because no blacks live here. So they've essentially taken 75% of the population and crammed or claimed to cram them onto 13% of the country. Now, I remember I was in high school and these countries were announced and most of the world said, we don't recognize those. They're not real countries. And I didn't understand that. I was like, well, what do you mean? They're African countries. Why wouldn't we recognize them? Because we did, I didn't understand that this was part of the South African government's strategy to control. Do people understand that? Do, you, do I need to explain anything else? Does anybody have any questions? Does this make sense? Why was this a good, not good like uh, morally good, but why was this a clever strategy of the South African government? Does that make sense? Did I explain it clear enough? All right. That brings us to the thing, the big event before what we need to talk about, right? Which is South Africans, mostly black, Indian, colored, were continuing to resist. And the famous moment that changes everything is the Sharpsville Massacre of 1960. Moms, children, kids, unarmed people, thousands of people gathered to protest the passes. We shouldn't have to be required to carry these passes. And long story short, the police opened fire on an unarmed crowd. They shot children, Women in the back, you can see the picture here. You can sort of see the angle, the direction. It's pretty clear what was going on. Hundreds of people were injured. Dozens of people were killed. 
and it shook the nation and it shook the movement to the core to see the willingness of the government to just open fire. Again, you can see in these pictures kind of what's going on, right? You don't see people hiding guns because they don't have them. These are just everyday normal citizens protesting. And the, 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 the trauma and the tragedy of it was intense. These are paintings that were done at the time to remember. <clears throat> it led to widespread arrests by the South African government of, of anybody accused of being involved in any kind of a protest. I'm not going to play the video. It also led to a total sort of re-questioning of what should we do next. Now they're killing us. It's not just about civil disobedience and filling prisons. Now it's about life and death. So what do we do next? What is our next move? What does the future hold in store for us? Was this big question. 